it's not just that the hospital environment is impersonal and sterile and, you know, maybe unpleasant for some people. It's that being in that environment has a direct physiological effect on how our bodies function. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. When I was a kid, my grandma used to harp on me about how important sleep was. And of course, as a kid, I thought, sleep, who needs that? That's for old people. Well, she happened to live until she was 99, so she might have been on to something. Now, most of you listening to this show know how important sleep is. And if you want a healthy life of vitality and longevity, you want to get seven to eight hours a night. Now, I know that can be very difficult. There's a number of different reasons. One of those reasons might be that you are low on magnesium. And if you don't have adequate levels of magnesium in your body, sleep can be very difficult. Now, there are actually seven unique forms of magnesium, and you got to get all three of them if you want to experience its calming, sleep-enhancing effects. That's why I always recommend Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers. All you got to do is take two capsules before you go to bed, and you will be amazed on how much better you sleep, and also how much more rested you'll feel when you wake up. So if you're ready to improve your sleep, and get more magnesium in your body, here's what you do. Go to magbreakthrough.com slash Luke. That's M-A-G-B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-H-G, magbreakthrough.com slash Luke. And if you want to get hooked up, enter the code Luke10 at checkout to save 10%. That's magbreakthrough.com slash Luke for the most incredible magnesium on the market. I'm going to admit something here, okay? I suck at cooking. Uh, I suck at making uh, smoothies, <laughs> elixirs. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean I can't make something that's good for you. And I can make a bomb-ass smoothie elixir that is incredibly fortifying and nutritious. However, making one that tastes good to a normal person is very challenging for me. So I'm, I'm kind of joking. I mean, I'm okay at it, but... Uh, One way I've managed to hack the system of creating amazing tasting smoothies and hot elixirs, both, that are not only delicious, but also highly nutritious is by using this product called Organifi Gold. It's kind of my secret weapon. I've had so many people over the years come to my house and I offer them, you know, an herbal drink of sorts to help them feel awesome. And, uh, you know, in most cases they say yes. And I come out with just about any drink I make, honestly, that has Organifi Gold in it is going to get a positive response. And then, of course, I just take the credit and say that I made it up. But what makes Organifi Gold awesome is not only that it tastes delicious, almost like a dessert or a golden latte if you've had one of those, but the fact that it has nine superfoods formulated for rest and relaxation. It's, of course, 100% certified organic, tastes delicious in warm or cold drink. It's also very low in sugar. And even though this is a very calming drink and one that's great at night to support with relaxation and sleep, you're going to wake up feeling refreshed without drowsiness, which is really important. Sometimes I'll take a sleep blend and it just knocks me out so much that the next morning I feel drowsy. So get your hands on some Organifi Gold. It's got turmeric, reishi mushroom, ginger, all of these incredible adaptogenic herbs and mushrooms. And that's something that I'm just a huge fan of. So if you want to get your grubby little paws on some, here's what you do. Go to Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I, Organifi with an I, Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. If you want to be smart, use the code LIFESTYLIST there to save yourself 20% off. That's Organifi.com slash LIFESTYLIST. Welcome, friends. This is episode 346 of the Lifestylist podcast. It's called Childbirth is Not a Medical Condition, The Free Birth Revolution with Yolanda Norris Clark. Today's guest came to my attention by way of a listener who recommended her on Instagram, and trust me, the recommendation did not disappoint. Yolanda Norris-Clark is a writer, 
holistic birth witness, teacher, coach, and mentor who views the birth process as a process of transformation. This episode is one of the most personally inspiring and enlightening podcasts I've ever done, and I don't make that claim in vain. Yolanda's perspective and experience on birth are both mind-blowing and heart-opening, so this is an episode you do not want to miss. The following are but a few of the deep topics we explore in this conversation. Why she left her home country of Canada in favor of a life in the jungle of Costa Rica to evade the authoritarian system currently in place there. Her incredible journey of giving birth to no less than eight children. And why parents who've given birth in the industrial medical complex should surrender their regret or guilt around having done so. The incredibly harrowing story of how an unfavorable ultrasound and midwife experience led her to discover free birth. The many downsides or risks of medical birth, why some mothers choose not to participate in allopathic industrial prenatal care, the cognitive dissonance held by most people around free versus hospital birth. We also explore the phenomenon of spontaneous physiological birth and how this idea differs from natural childbirth, the misuse of the word natural as it commonly pertains to the birthing process, the most important factors that contribute to a positive birth outcome the risks of having a free birth, why hiring a midwife might not be the path to a holistic birth, the spiritual and energetic significance of birth as a rite of passage for parents, how reclaiming birth is the ecstatic, spiritual, transformative experience for both mother, baby, and father, the critical importance of reclaiming birth as the ecstatic, spiritual, transformative experience for both mother, baby, and father, How birth is a central aspect of our ascension as individuals and the collective. How birth and the way our culture practices birth is connected with COVID, allopathic medicine, and the reset and revolution we're presently moving through as a civilization. How birth trauma impacts our lives as adults and how we can begin the process of healing, including my own personal journey doing just that. The horrors of circumcision and its negative impact on the male psyche and behavior around sex, intimacy, and emotional health. The many correlations between birth, death, and transcendent plant medicine experiences. And finally, why so many feminists fail to fight the abuse of women at the hands of the medical system. So as you can see, based on those topics, this is a potentially inflammatory, if not triggering conversation. So I encourage you to listen with an open mind and an open heart. And for those of you who missed my prior birth episode, number 308, with Janice Barcelo, you'll likely want to go back and give that one a listen for a more detailed scientific explanation of the dangers and risks of medical birth explored in this episode. But for now, roll up your sleeves and prepare to take part in one of the most important conversations in the history of this show. And if you feel as moved by it as I did, please share it with a few friends. Enjoy the show and may you and your family be blessed with health and happiness always. All right, here we go, Yolanda. I've been looking forward to this conversation and it is now happening. I can see in the background there, you are in the jungles of Costa Rica. Lucky you. I am very lucky. Uh, It's my first here. My first question, uh, not knowing your complete story, but doing as much research as I could would be, did you happen to flee Canada because of all the lockdowns and COVID drama up there? Or was there another reason that you moved down South? Not really. No. Uh, We had, my husband and I and our our six young kids had uh, actually just purchased the house of our dreams in Canada. And we had just established our pottery school, which was a project that um, my husband Lee and I had been working on together for about 15 years. And my birth coaching business was going wonderfully. And uh, yeah, our life was all in order, all set up. We knew we had a had a clear path ahead of us. Yeah. And then... Um, and then Rona hit and uh, yeah, it was just very, very disorienting. And I started speaking my mind on the topic of uh, this totalitarian technocratic coup, as I see it, um, back in February of 2020. And at that point, the response was overwhelmingly um, unsupportive, I, I would have to say, <laughs> initially. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of became persona non grata in my 
community. And I had already been ruffling a few feathers, I'll admit, Luke, over the years, especially when it comes to my perspective on on birth, which we're, we're going to talk about today. Um, and so this was just kind of the, I think, the last straw for the lovely, very conservative, very obedient people of New Brunswick, Canada. And um, yeah, I had some interesting and unpleasant encounters with, with, uh, with some people. And, um, and my husband and I kind of looked around and we, we really had a very clear sense that things were not going to be going back to normal anytime soon. And, you know, I really wish that, uh, I wish that we'd been wrong when we, when we left initially, we left Canada in October of 2020. And I was still sort of thinking, well, you know, I guess we, we can always come back, right? Uh, you know, once things sort of settle down and, but I think I, I also knew on some level that, um, that things were never, ever, ever going to be the same. And so, yeah, we just embarked on this big adventure and uh, we went first to the Dominican Republic where we have some friends and some connections. Uh, and then I was actually invited to attend a twin home birth in Costa Rica. And so uh, I came here initially first, just with my oldest, with our oldest son uh, and my husband and our five youngest stayed in, in the Dominican because we weren't really sure where we were going, we were going to land. Um, but when I got here, I just met so many wonderful people and there's such an incredible community here and a really lovely kind of back to the land seen people who are really interested in doing permaculture and and kind of living off the land and there's abundant water and food and amazing people and so here we are yeah uh, good for you i'm so glad that you were able to uh make that move as a, a bystander i mean obviously looking at most countries in the world uh and agreeing with your perspective that um <laughs> it's not looking good for people that enjoy liberty, um, Canada seems to be one of the worst. I mean, some of the things going on up there, and I don't use I don't use comparisons like this lightly, and don't mean to offend anyone listening, but it is very reminiscent of, you know, Nazi Germany in the beginning. I mean, it's like that's what it is. It's just crazy. So I feel for your your countrymen up there. Um, it looks rough. I, I really feel for people there. And, you know, I just left California for uh, many of the same reasons uh, for, for Texas, for greener pastures over here and a little more room to breathe as a sovereign human. Um, so yeah, I totally get it. And I was, I was just curious if that had something to do with it and it sounds like it did and God, good for you and for your kids too. I mean, that's one of the things with all of this that I look at, I'm an adult. So if I find it totally necessary to go into Whole Foods and they want me to cover my breathing holes, um, you know, I, I can play the game for a minute, although I avoid it like the plague, but um, children don't really have a choice or the ability to contextualize what's going on. So I just feel, feel uh, terrible about the trauma that's being inflicted on them as a result of all this nonsense. But anyway, let's talk about something fun. Uh, you have a ton of kids. How many, I how, do. Many, how many kids do you have at this point? <laughs> It's, it's very, uh, very unusual. Yes. Um, at this point, Luke, I have eight children. So eight humans have passed through my body into the world. Um, but I kind of have two batches. So I have two older sons, um, from a first, uh, earlier relationship and, uh, they actually live in, in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And, um, and my husband and I have six young kids. Yeah. Wow. Well, if I'm going to talk to someone about giving birth, you <laughs> are the person, obviously. <laughs> That's just, I can't fathom that, you know, as a guy who's just been, I would say, I mean, not against having kids earlier on. Well, yeah, earlier on, I would say against because like, I don't want to lose my freedom, man. But also someone who, you know, is 50 and haven't been passionate enough about the idea or been with the right person to really explore it. And the idea to me, uh, as Allison and I move in that direction of having one kid, is is daunting just in terms of not knowing how to do it and wanting to do it right all the things many of which we'll discuss but also i just think man how do you sleep or like find time to do a podcast and the things i'm like if you can do it with six like i've got to be able to find a way to do it with one i'm a pretty high performing guy so um, congratulations on <laughs> flying in the face of the depopulators uh, of the world that are 
not only uh, in my estimation, eliminating a lot of people currently, but also um, highly discouraging people to have families and do normal human things like procreating and repopulating the planet after the elders pass on. So good for you. Uh, Yeah. That's really, it's interesting that you say that, Luke, because I, for many years, I mean, really up until, really up, up until this past February, 2020, probably, I used to consider myself to be a a leftist and a liberal and a progressive, but also a little bit of a misfit in that crowd because I, my life is sort of dedicated to, to birth and my family. And, you know, we just, my husband and I kind of kept having these kids and, (laughs) and most of them were, were happy accidents, (laughs) Sort of, maybe, although I think subconsciously, you know, this is this is certainly all part of the plan. But for quite a few years, I would feel sort of vaguely guilty about our large family. And I would sort of feel the need to, I don't know, kind of explain myself. And I also received a lot of really, really obnoxious comments from acquaintances and strangers you know, basically asking me who the heck do I think I am to think that I have a right to destroy the ozone layer, contribute to overpopulation, you know, mess up the planet single-handedly. And my perspective on that has really shifted quite a bit. And it's been, it's been very, very liberating actually um, to, to sort of allow that to fall away and, and to really just embrace the fact that I have this amazing family and we have so much fun. And, you know, you were mentioning earlier, how, how does one kind of wrap one's mind around getting things done with, with kids? And I mean, we just, we, we do what, what we have to do, but in many ways, and, and I don't want this to discourage you at all, Luke, but I found having one child maybe the most challenging in some ways because you're kind of figuring it all out and you know they're this sort of precious parcel that that you don't want anything bad to happen to and now that i have this just horde of kids oh my goodness it's just it either gets easier or my standards have fallen to such an extent <laughs> that you know i'm like just super relaxed about everything but but we do have a lot of fun and you know they entertain each other and and uh, i'm a very you know i have a very specific well a very yeah i mean my 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 parenting philosophy is is such that I, I really encourage my kids to just explore their environment and you know we've never used baby gates or like really strollers or apparatuses all that much at all. And so, yeah, I love to see them explore the boundaries of their bodies and their environment. And that's another reason why it's such a joy to be here in this place where we really live in the jungle and and they can be free to climb and roam and play and swim in the river and do all the things that humans like to do when they're free. Oh, that's incredible. I, I, uh, I congratulate you on all of that. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, some concepts here that it could be somewhat controversial due to the fact that um, many of us, at least in Western culture, have been indoctrinated into uh, birthing in ways that we uh, perceive to be normal in the medical system, etc. What would you have to say before we get started for mothers or fathers for that matter listening who are in alignment with what we're going to present today but might feel a sense of guilt or shame because they had kids within that system and have some sense of regret because they didn't know yet that there's another way right yeah that's a great question i would say to those parents that as human beings i see our greatest strength and our greatest vulnerability to be the fact that we can seemingly adapt to almost any circumstance, right? I mean, human beings are more resilient than, <laughs> than, than any other creature, really. And we can kind of contort ourselves to fit um, even the most adverse of circumstances and environments. But it's also my conviction that we have the capacity to heal from literally anything, including birth trauma. And I do look around 
and observe that 99% of all of the humans on earth make up kind of this cohort of, of the walking wounded, really. I think we have all been deeply traumatized to some extent. And I think birth plays a really pivotal, um, formative role in, in that trauma. And actually, I see the industrial birth institution as a system that, that deliberately uh, enacts trauma and abuse, um, because that's one of the ways that uh, we are initiated into the kind of uh, dependency and lack and you know, perspectives of subordination that I think have contributed to the situation that, that we found ourselves in now all over the world. But I do think that we're capable of healing from that kind of trauma. And for me personally, I do think we're capable of healing from trauma related to birth experiences. And I think I'm a good example of that myself because actually I was born under incredibly adverse uh, circumstances. So um, my mother was subjected to kind of the whole gamut of abusive, traumatizing interventions short of surgical birth. So I did emerge from my mother's vagina, but I was kind of ripped out and my mother's body was cut and I had a nuchal cord, which is when the umbilical cord is wrapped around a baby's neck. Um, and this is still uh, used as a pretext for legitimating a whole host of totally unnecessary and just ridiculous and, and harmful responses. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just I'm just waiting for that that to pass, Luke. Um, and and so on account of of this this nuchal cord, which as as many of us now know is not in any way a problem. I mean, thirty to forty percent of the babies that I've witnessed being born have the cord wrapped around their necks and it's actually highly adaptive. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a, an example of how brilliant the human body is that babies um, wrap themselves up in their umbilical cord, because what that does is it, adapt, it actually prevents cord prolapse, which is when the cord um, falls out of a mother's vagina prior to the baby's body emerging. And that can be a very, very serious life-threatening situation. So it's brilliant when babies wrap themselves up in the cord. This is a wonderful thing. It's not a problem. It's not a pathology, um, but it's still used as, like I said, a pretext for initiating a whole bunch of, of interventions that are harmful and unnecessary. And so in my case, the nuchal cord was used as a rationalization for immediately cutting the cord, which again is quite, quite dangerous and harmful because babies, when they're emerging, they really require that lifeline to remain intact because they're still receiving oxygen from the cord. And when the cord is cut immediately, that can really compromise this very, very important period of of a of, of really sacred transition that, that all babies go through to calibrate to the outside world. So my cord was cut immediately. I was taken away, whisked away from my mother. My mom didn't touch me for about eight hours after I was born. So I was taken to um, the neonatal resuscitation unit. I was placed in a glass um, incubator uh, and I was given a bottle of sugar water and that was my first encounter with the outside world was um, being isolated and alone and uh, being given you no know, toxic sludge to drink. Um, I, I am one of those people who, who, who had you know, very, a very traumatic birth experience. And I'm so grateful in so many ways because it really has shaped who I am. And you know, I felt a lot of rage um, and anger for, for many years um, about what happened. Um, and the way that I entered the world and, and not even, you know, I, I felt a lot of sort of um, conscious anger, but I've also done so much work that has uncovered ways that my birth has impacted me unconsciously as well. You know, ways that I move through the world and, and I think perspectives that I have and fears that I have that, that I, I understand now have been informed by my birth experience. Um, 
but it also really inspired me to dedicate my life to to this work and to sharing with as many people as as possible the sort of open secret um, that that I and 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 lots of other women too uh, have discovered, which is that birth is not a pathology. Pregnancy is not a pathology. Birth is not an inherently medical event. Um, it's actually the most incredibly just wild and beautiful portal to spiritual awakening and transformation and connectedness and wholeness that we have available to us as as human beings. And it's the most significant experience. I mean, this should be very obvious, right? It's the most significant experience of a person's life that their 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 initial entry into the world um but it's also one of the most significant experiences of our lives as women and the choices that i made around the births of my children have done so much to heal my own birth traumas um and uh yeah, so it's pretty amazing. I think there's always an opportunity for us to to heal. And, you know, in some cases, um, well, I actually know that the experiences that I have had giving birth have also been profoundly healing for my mother. And I like to think that, you know, time kind of moves in ways that we don't necessarily perceive in this three-dimensional world. And I feel like we can also kind of heal backwards in a way and address ancestral wounds and traumas through the decisions that we make as individuals going forward and with our own families as well. So yeah, there's just, there's so much there. And, and I think, you know, in so many ways, birth is kind of the last frontier, right? I mean, as you... No, Luke, and probably most of your listeners too, you know, we live in this world, um, and this has been in play for such a long time, in which you know, everything that is truly rational and authentic and natural and correct, according to the laws of nature, has been inverted and kind of capsized by design, right? In order, I think, to keep human beings in kind of a, a state of perpetual uncertainty and disorganization and in effect to to conceal from us our our true power in some way our 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 true ability to connect with spirit and and to to obscure our innate psychic aptitudes and our intrinsic capacity to communicate and to tune in with with planes of existence outside of of this realm that we can see with our eyes in front of us right um and so when we look around at the way that the contemporary world is structured almost every single institution and convention and custom and social procedure is is i think set up to reinforce this disorientation because if human beings were truly able to know ourselves deeply and to understand ourselves and to contextualize ourselves accurately as the exquisitely sensitive and brilliant and luminous beings that we are, uh, who, who truly belong to this world and to each other, uh, I think the current state of chaos and disorder and dysfunction that we see all around us would, would cease to be. And I think we're actually moving through that right now, you know, through this incredible revolution that, that we're all living into. And, you know, I see this, this growing awareness in, in every area of life. You know, people are taking their kids out of these broken education systems and, and teaching them at home. And people are, you know, shifting their relationship to these financial systems. And, um, and more and more women are, are also recognizing that, the way that we do birth in this culture is not uh, not serving us. I don't think not serving wow. not serving us at all. Oh man, there, <laughs> there's so much grist for the mill in that uh, in that dialogue. There, wow, um, so many things I could pick and unpack. I guess I'm going to go back to your realization 
uh, later in life of uh, reconciling your own birth trauma and the story that you told about being separated from your mom in in ways that were unnatural and uh, uh, cutting of the cord that um, you know is bringing these vital nutrients, oxygen, stem cells, all the things a baby needs to survive and thrive. Uh, that natural law being interrupted and circumvented by that experience and how that really carries on and and informs who you become. And in my own uh, journey here, and one of the main reasons I actually uh, you know went after you for an interview was really in my own healing of my own birth trauma and also in my desire to stop that, uh, to break the link in that chain for my lineage. And, and I really think that there's a lot to that backward healing because in the quantum realm, there, your birth and my birth are present right now in this moment. There is no then and there's no future, you know, in the great scheme of consciousness, right? Um, I was shown uh, in an ayahuasca ceremony actually in Costa Rica uh, interestingly enough, on one night where I had no perceivable effects of the medicine, it was one out of four nights and it was what they call a nada, which means in Spanish, nothing, like nothing happened. I just kind of laid there and writhed in nausea and uh, I was just going, oh my God, what time is it? When is this going to be over kind of thing, which is not characteristic of most of my journeys since. Uh, so I thought, wow, what a, what a waste of a night. I could have been sleeping kind of, but um, there was a brief moment in which I had sort of a vision, not like a hallucinatory vision, but just kind of like a little daydream for a moment, probably around four in the morning, I guess, a morning dream. And and I was shown this sequence of events in which I was born in a hospital room. And then when I came out, they put me on my mom's chest for a minute. This was this was the, the the brief vision at least, and then and then I was taken to another room and put in an incubator, and I I remember stories from my grandmother on my father's side saying how cute I was in this little incubator, and it was kind of a little family story, and I never thought anything of it. Um, so I did I did have that bit of factual data somewhere in my memory that there was an incubator involved. I never thought about it at all as being significant, but in this brief uh, vision. I was put in the incubator and just left all alone. And I had this sense of um, just this uh, depth of loneliness and kind of like, why did, why did that happen? And did that happen the way that I envisioned it? So the next day I sent a text to my mom and said, hey, I'm in Costa Rica doing ayahuasca. She probably doesn't even know what ayahuasca is. Uh, and I just, I had this little daydream, mom, what do you think? And I, and I typed it out, uh, as I just explained to you and the listeners, and she sent a text right back and said, that's exactly what happened. Um, with the exception that uh, they wrapped me in a little swath of some sort and then put me on her chest. Because in the vision, I was like a naked, you know, little bloody baby. Um, so they wrapped me up, which I've since learned there's problems with that because of interruption of pheromone transmission and things like that from the detergents and the non-organic blanket that they wrapped you in and stuff. And then they did in fact throw me in an incubator. Uh, God bless them. You know, I'm sure they were doing what they felt to be right as part of this broken system uh, and left me in there for four days. And I couldn't be uh, held or uh, touched or have any real human interaction. I was just seen like a zoo animal through the window. And uh, and it took me a while to unpack that information, as it seems uh, you have as well. And what I took from that was that um, in that experience was born this sense of existential loneliness that I felt for most of my life. And like you, it's, it's been incredibly uh, motivating, not just to share information like we're sharing in this conversation, but also in um, just in an interpersonal way, unpacking so many of the patterns that developed in my life based on that sense of, you know, missing such a key moment in birth, right? And uh, feeling this sense of separation and distance between my fellow humans and just this inability to really connect. Um, and uh, obvious abandonment issues, right? That interrupted my capacity for intimacy uh, well into my adult life until quite recently. So uh, like you, I don't know if I would go back and do it any different because 
that shaped who I am today and has informed not only who I am, but the work that I'm doing in the world and uh, sharing information like this and also uh, really having the ability to go back. And I mean, you want to talk about like root causes. I mean, at least within this incarnation, what a gift to be able to be shown that and to kind of go all the way back to that moment and start over and really start healing all of those parts of my, my being that were affected negatively by that. And then of course, you know, following that comes the circumcision and there's been a lot of work around that uh, also as a result. And, um, you know, I'm always careful about painting medicines uh, and, you know, plant medicines and psychedelics as the be all end all to all things. But I, I have to be honest and say that many of these realizations for me have come as a result of very intentional ceremonial experiences. And um, in one of them was this whole realization about my um, disconnection with true intimacy and love as it pertains to sexuality as a result of circumcision. And that's a whole other podcast probably. And I've done a podcast about it with an expert on the subject prior. But I think this is such important work for us as individuals to heal. And then as you said so brilliantly to uh, break that cycle of trauma and have the opportunity to at least explore in in some degree uh, this idea of free birth and going back to having birth as nature or God designed us. So it's um, it's just, uh, I don't want to hog up the conversation here, but it's just, it really moves me to hear your story because there are so many parallels there. Um, with that, I'd like to kind of fast forward to uh, the experience that you shared about uh, having this sort of invasive ultrasound uh, during, uh, maybe it was, I forget which number of your pregnancies, because you've had a few, and uh, the awakening that began from that moment when you had this innate wisdom within you that something's not right here. Maybe you could tell us a bit about the beginning of your journey uh, as a mother and what led you to explore a completely alternative route to bringing life into the world. Yeah. Um, well, that's a really interesting question, Luke. Um, so I have to actually thank my mother, first of all, for, um, for always being very, very open and honest with me about my birth story. So uh, my mom is is a pretty amazing woman, and um, I just appreciate so much that I really grew up always hearing from her that the way that I came into the world was not good, <laughs> not good for her or for me, and that she was pretty upset about it, and, and I think still is. Um, and that really gave me kind of permission to to look at it and to kind of like. I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't actually remember the first time that I heard my birth story because it's, it's just something I grew up talking with my mom about openly from a really young age. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's one of the reasons that I, I think I've been, um, fairly well equipped to, to explore these topics. Um, and that's also one of the reasons that when I first became pregnant, when I was 19 years old, um, I had already, I had already decided, and, and this is part of my mother's influence as well. I mean, she was actually very, very much ahead of her time. And, you know, as kids, I have two younger siblings. We never went to see the doctor. My mother never would have even dreamed of giving us Tylenol. You know, if we were ever sick, it was go eat an orange and lie down. You'll feel better soon. Um, so I really appreciate that as well. Uh, so I was never, I was not really brought up in, in, a, in a sort of a, a, a medicalized mindset. Um, so when I found out I was pregnant at 19, I had an idea that I would like to have a home birth, um, but it wasn't something that I had come across in my personal life. You know, I didn't know anyone who'd given birth at home. I was born in the hospital, my, my younger siblings as well. And um, and so it was kind of a vague notion. Um, and so I did actually initially, when I found out I was pregnant, go and see our family doctor who had kind of been on the periphery. She was a personal friend of my, my mom's and someone that I you know, felt relatively comfortable with. And I had never really seen her as a patient, but she was someone that I knew. And so I went to see her and she gave me a... Um, 
a blood test. And then she suggested that I go and have an ultrasound. And I didn't even know what ultrasound meant. I I, I knew nothing at this point. Um, and so she she gave me the, the 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 script or the you know prescription to to go to this office in a different part of town, and this was in Vancouver, BC, uh, where I grew up. And uh, and so I showed up at this ultrasound clinic, and I had been instructed to <laughs> to fill my bladder, so to drink as much water as I could so that I had a full bladder. And I didn't understand why I wasn't informed as to why. Um, so I was waiting in this waiting room with, with these other women. And I was so, I mean, I was just, I was so young. I was a baby. I was 19 years old and, and it was all very sort of mystifying. And, and then I was finally called in. And at this point, you know, I, you know, this is kind of part of the, 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 Part of the design, I think, of the medical establishment is is part of it is sort of um, to make strange the situation. You know, I think every encounter we have on some level with the allopathic uh, medical industrial complex is is kind of designed to position the patient uh, as subordinate to the professionals, right? And so I think part of that is, is making people wait, you know, when you have to wait, you start to feel uncomfortable and then you start to feel a little bit insecure. And, and that I think serves this hierarchical, uh, sort of status organization in a way. So I was finally called in. And at this point I really, really had to pee so, so, so badly. And I was in this room with, with a, a, a male, um, technician and he told me to take my pants off. And I was like, what? Wait, what? Take my pants off? Okay, I thought I could just, you know, pull my underwear down just a little bit because you're going to just give me an ultrasound like on my abdomen, right? And like I said, at this point, I knew nothing about ultrasound. Um, and now I'm very, very well informed as to the the numerous... Um, not only risks, but objective harms that ultrasound causes. And I don't let anyone near me with a Doppler or an ultrasound machine ever, ever, ever at all. I mean, I would, I would sooner do all sorts of things. So I, I don't ever engage with, with ultrasound. Um, I don't personally believe that, uh, that the risks outweigh the benefits on any level. Um, and I don't see any benefit either. But anyway, that's kind of a different story. So I was asked to take my pants off and Stunningly, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this now, but I did. And I mean, as a 40 year old woman at this point, I, you know, I I talk with my daughters all the time about situations like this. But it's so indicative of the the degree to which I had been successfully disciplined to see these people in their white coats as as superior, as authoritative, as, you know, people who I, I had to listen to, I had to obey these people. So even though internally I'm, you know, screaming and thinking this, I don't I, no, I what am I doing here? I want to go to the bathroom and then go home, like get away from me. It was just incredibly predatory. But again, this is kind of how, how the situation or how this, how the system is often set up. So, so I did, I took my pants off and and lo and behold, all of a sudden, there's a uh, a dildo shaped object being pushed into my vagina. So there was not even an explanation as to what this procedure would entail. But essentially, I was, you know, raped by this machine um, uh, as a as a young, very innocent nineteen year old girl, uh, and. Um, and it was very, very unpleasant in, in every way. And so I left that office just traumatized and stunned. Uh, and, and, I, and I didn't, I, I, I had no idea why I was there, what this was about. None of it made any sense to me. I had been given no real information. Uh, and then two days later, I started to bleed and I ended up uh, miscarrying. That, that first pregnancy. Uh, and this is a story that I have heard over and over and over again, um, especially with women who have um, received transvaginal ultrasounds, which is 
what, what, what had happened to me. Um, that, and I mean, there've been numerous animal studies done on ultrasound that, uh, show a very, very strong correlation between ultrasound and miscarriage. Um, and I have no doubt in my mind that that was what initiated, um, my miscarriage. And again, because I, I didn't know anything. I hadn't done any research about anything. This was all new to me. Um, the experience was very, very painful of, of miscarrying. And so I went to the hospital and my experience in the hospital was, it, it felt like a continuation of the kind of abuse that I, I had experienced at that clinic. Um, and I was treated very badly, very poorly. Um, I think in part because I was so young. So there are a lot of judgments that are made about women who are too young or too old to be having children or, you know, too big, too small, too whatever. Um, but I wasn't treated very well. And the sort of, <laughs> the, 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 the kind of apotheosis of this whole experience was finally uh, going through um, a DNC where uh, the doctors um, put metal instruments inside my uterus and, and scraped away at the, um, you know, at the, the remaining uh, tissue, which I now know, again, is, is totally unnecessary. And I have actually had two subsequent miscarriages and I've supported many women in, um, in their home spontaneous miscarriages because our bodies, just as they are equipped to gestate babies spontaneously and to give birth spontaneously, we're also actually very well equipped to move babies that are not meant to be alive for whatever reason through our bodies um, uh, in the vast majority of cases without any problem. And in fact, I, I feel personally that um, a spontaneous home miscarriage is far, far, far safer than subjecting oneself to um, the kind of procedures that are done in the hospital, which again involve, you know, metal instruments being poked and prodded into our organs that are very internal for a reason, right? I mean, these are precious and important uh, reproductive organs. Um, and, and, you know, there's also this perspective in the medical realm that our bodies are kind of these, these mechanistic you know, machines essentially, right? And that we can, we can take parts out and and fit parts back in, and you know, knit foreign objects into various places, and and it's it's fine. But you know, I now see my body as a a whole kind of luminous spiritual being, and all of my organs are part of that whole, and I don't allow anyone to put anything inside my body or come near me with anything really for, for, for any reason, unless it's something that I'm, I'm actively inviting. So I had this experience of, of the DNC where my, my fetus was sucked out of my body and I was lying there kind of dosed up on, on morphine. Um, and I, I remember looking up at the doctor, another male doctor, um, and saying, I want to see it. I want to have it. Like I want my baby. I want, I want it. And the doctor looked down at me and said, it's medical waste. And then he turned around and left the room. And that too was, it was almost illuminate. Like it was, it, it felt beatific almost. It was so outrageous and so disgusting that it, it almost like popped me out of this sort of reverie. And it filled me with, yes, rage, absolutely, but also just this absolutely potent and, and electrifying determination. And I had just this flash of insight that I would never, ever, ever, ever walk through these doors again. And, and I actually remember walking out of the hospital into the sun and just knowing that my life had absolutely changed and that I would never, ever be part of that system ever again. And I've had eight, eight babies at home and have never had anything to do with that system again, pretty much. Right? Wow. So wow. yeah, it was quite the experience. 
<laughs> what an incredible story. Oh my God. I'm so glad you're um, in a place to be able to share that and articulate such a, I mean, a pivotal, a traumatic yet pivotal experience, you know? And I think there's something I always come back to on the show in these conversations. And perhaps I choose people uh, that are aligned in that way. But so many of us go through such horrific human experiences, yet certain uh, people are able to transmute those and alchemize those into their life's work and use those experiences to help untold people. It's just, it's wild. The human spirit is just so, um, so resilient, you know, and so resourceful. Um, and I, I feel for the people that have these experiences and and are unable for whatever reason to sort of, you know, find the gold in them and use them as um, fuel for a mission, a greater mission. And also, you know, a fuel to do things differently and make such a resolute decision as you did. And then prove yourself right by going off and having a bunch of kids at home that I'm presuming are doing fine. Um, so thank you for sharing that. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. I want to take a moment to share with you an incredible discovery that human beings have been using to improve their well-being for at least 3,000 years. And I'm one of those human beings. It's a plant medicine known as kava. Now, kava has been historically used by South Pacific Islanders as a safe, non-addictive alternative to drugs and alcohol because it naturally boosts the brain's main pleasure chemicals like GABA, serotonin, and dopamine, while at the same time, strangely, increasing ketone production and mental energy. This means that it provides you with a relaxed sense of well-being, but also helps you focus. Now, most plant medicines will either speed you out and make you feel all tweaked, where you might be productive, but you don't necessarily feel happy, while others can bring you down and make you so relaxed you just want to fall asleep or sit in your ass all day. So kava is very unique in that it activates parts of our biology that help us to feel relaxed and focused at the same time. Now, as I said, it increases ketones, which also makes it an incredible tool for fasting. This is something you can add to your bulletproof coffee in the morning to enhance that calm and focused state and also something you can supplement at night just to relax and chill. I mean, it does have uh, you know, somewhat of a recreational application if that's what you were going for. I love to use it at night when I'm just ready to stop working and wind down, and getting ready to go to sleep, improve my deep sleep scores, etc. So Kava is incredible. And there's only one company I would trust when it comes to Kava. It's called True Kava. And you can find it at this website. It's gettruekava.com. That's G-E-T-T-R-U-K-A-V-A, gettruekava.com. While you're getting your chill on at gettruekava.com, you can save 15% off with the code LUKE15. Enjoy. And now back to the interview. Next thing I want to cover is well, first I want to say for the people that wanted to unpack some of the ultrasound stuff, and I'm sure we could do a whole show on this, but I did an interview with a woman named Janice uh, Barcelo recently, and um, actually a few months ago. And it was uh, it was one that was quite triggering for a lot of people because she went like deep into the matrix of uh, what she perceived to be this, to quote, Luciferian system. And I, and I don't disagree, uh, but I think her perspective was kind of so hardcore. Some people had a hard time swallowing it and yours is a much softer journey through that. Uh, so people can go back and click on the show notes and get like tons of information about why ultrasounds are probably not a great idea. Um, and I think it would be wise to do so because that's kind of one of the first interventions that starts to take place during pregnancy, as I understand it. Um, I guess, where do I want to go with this? God, there's so much. Um, I guess let's unpack how you would define free birth as opposed to an industrial medicalized birth. What does that look like from a zoomed out perspective? Mm, okay, that's a great question. So I think it's really important to, to really look at the way that language is manipulated and, and controlled um, in, in many ways. So maybe I can just start with with um, you know, unpacking a little bit the, the, um, 
this idea of, of natural birth, right? So the word natural has, I think, become quite distorted and, and politicized in many ways. And in the birth world, uh, especially a few years ago, it's really, you know, I've, I've been doing this work for, for almost 20 years now. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to see how the sort of trends shift and, and change, right? So a few years ago, uh, looking back to that time, uh, the word natural was, was being discussed a lot. And actually, I think this was actually a precursor to this phenomenon that is, is now all over the place, the sort of uh, de-sexing of the language of birth. Uh, so you might be aware that uh, throughout uh, the natural, so-called natural birth world, um, it's no longer considered acceptable to refer to birthing women um, or, or breastfeeding or even mothers in many cases. Um, and instead, we are told that the socially acceptable terms are uh, birthing persons um, or birthing parents or chest feeding because of course uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh lord because of course luke men can also give birth right and so it's frowned upon to be discriminatory by suggesting that only only women give birth um and so looking back um you know i remember about 10 years ago prior to all of this newer stuff happening it had become unacceptable to refer to natural birth because of course the implication was that there are ways of giving birth that are not natural if we're using that word right and this was seen as a judgment and judgments are threatening now i personally don't really subscribe to this way of thinking and i I do believe that there are birth practices that are natural uh, and birth practices that are not only unnatural but but abusive and and even damaging and and objectively harmful. Uh, And I have no problem acknowledging that openly. However, a kind of companion piece to this prohibition against making a distinction between natural and unnatural is that we also then see increasingly women referring to their hospital births as natural or their inductions as natural. Um, And actually, I was just looking at the etymology of the word natural recently. and it's, it's really interesting. It, it comes from, from the Middle English definition, which is, what was it? Having a certain status by birth is what the origin of the word natural means in, in Middle English. Um, and then in Latin, I think it's like naturalis, which again means from nature or, or by birth. Um, and so... I guess one of my personal interests or, or commitments is to, to stubbornly use language for its primary purpose, which in my view is to make distinctions uh, and, and in a way to make judgments, right? Judgments not towards individual people and their choices, but, but using words to, to rigorously judge institutions that in many cases, I think, keep us enthralled and, and kind of hypnotized into certain belief systems or, or ways of seeing the world. So I would actually argue that there is no natural birth in the hospital because the hospital environment is as contrary as one can get to the kind of environment that is conducive to birth proceeding optimally. And and really the hospital environment represents, uh, I think, the antithesis of what a human being requires in order to give birth in a way that is most likely to be easeful and pleasurable and optimal and conducive to a positive outcome for for both mother and baby. Um, So I don't really use the... So that's kind of how I see that the the idea of natural birth, but I actually don't really use the term natural very much anymore. And that's partly because in general, the word natural, I think, has been kind of denatured and and distorted in in many contexts. So, you know, natural foods can include like packaged granola bars full of sugar and refined chemicals and that's like natural, right? Like what does a natural food really mean? You know, I right. So, I think this is this is kind of what's happened to birth in a way. And so now we're in the situation where uh I think women have been groomed to interpret observations about how birth works as a form of personal criticism. Um, 
And I think women have also been groomed to bypass the trauma that they experience during birth, uh, during the process of giving birth to their babies uh, through this idea of reframing those traumatic experiences by kind of decorating what they went through with like pretty flowers and ribbons, uh, which is where I think we get terms like natural cesarean birth, right? Like, what does that really mean? It's a bit of a euphemism, right? Um, And even natural hospital birth. So not only is any birth experience that ends with a baby somehow, some way coming out of the mother's vagina, uh, no matter how brutal and abusive that experience might have been, uh, being termed a natural birth, but even we even have the, the sort of so-called natural cesarean, natural induction. And so when I talk about the kinds of births that I've had with my eight babies or the kinds of births that I aim to facilitate uh, with my clients, I actually usually use the term uh, physiological birth. Um, and most of the time, people don't know what I'm talking about when I use that phrase, which in a way is great because it then means that I get to explain it. And in so doing, I can give people a bit of a sense of how birth actually works. Because what I found in doing this work for so long is that unless you actually understand at least the basics of the physiology of birth, which really means you know how birth unfolds according to the impeccable laws of nature uh, and in accordance with the hormonal blueprint and the kind of chemical blueprint, you can't really understand why birth choices are such a big deal and why birth itself is such a big deal and, and how to make powerful choices, especially when it comes to the kind of support you seek out for your pregnancy and birth or, um, or where you end up giving birth to, right? Because, um, I think as a pregnant woman, uh, the people that you welcome into your sphere, including your you know, main support person, will maybe have the most significant impact on, on how your birth plays out. So when it comes to, to free birth or, or wild birth, I mean, these are terms that, um, that in my, from my perspective, mean a woman choosing to give birth entirely outside of the medical framework and actually outside of, in the absence of uh, anyone who has been brought in from outside who has any kind of expertise or, or professional perspective on birth. So I see free birth and wild birth as family birth like a woman who, who simply decides to give birth with her partner or her children um, and who has no interest in involving you know, a doula or a midwife or, or a traditional birth attendant or anything like that. And you know, this is a pretty controversial subject. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with, with this idea of giving birth wholly outside of any kind of um, relationship that involves someone who has any expertise or, or kind of authority in birth. Um, and I think a lot of women make the choice to free birth uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, but I have also seen, especially in the past 10 years, um, women describing their births as free births when they have a midwife there or a doula there. And that's not really how I personally perceive the meaning of those terms. But at the same time, women totally own their births, so they can call their births whatever they want. But I also think that it's useful to, um, yeah, like I said, use words to kind of describe the distinctions between things and experiences and and perspectives. And so um, I think one of the reasons that free birth has grown in popularity and has kind of become this slightly distorted thing that a lot of people can't really agree on what it means is has a lot to do with the current political situation when it comes to midwifery. And that's another topic that I don't know if you want to get into, it's a, but <laughs> it's a topic that's on my list. Uh, this, this answer is uh, illuminating a lot for me, you know, as you're, as you're speaking and sort of making this definition, uh, your own definition as to what a free or wild birth is. I am observing within myself. It's like, 
this nervousness, you know, and it just shows the, it shows how deep the programming is. When you say like, there's no doula or midwife or anyone who's been professionally trained in any capacity, it's just like a family birth inside me, there's alarms going off. Like that sounds very dangerous. Like someone's got to know what to do. And it, it just goes to show, right? It's like, I'm not even someone who's, I've never been present for a birth. I've known very few people that even have kids or I've not around pregnant people. Like I am such a newbie to this whole world. And um, so I can see my bias as someone who is very anti-authoritarian in all ways um, going like, well, I mean, you can't just do it like that. Uh, you know, like, how do you know what to do? So it's, it's interesting to observe that. Um, it, from that perspective, though, okay, so say, I'm just going to personalize this. So Alice and I are talking about having kids. Um, She's currently 43. We just bought a house. Like there's a couple things we, I think, need to do to kind of create the space for that, literally the space of a home for that. Um, and the idea of just getting pregnant and just hanging out and chilling. And then one day she's like, I think I'm in labor. And we just watch a baby come out. Like I'm assuming if you're not bringing in professionals, there is a bit of a learning curve where one would have to self-study and know what to do with the umbilical cord and placenta. And, you know, if something goes quote unquote wrong, like then do you run to the hospital? Do you have like a professional on standby who's not present? Um, you know, what, what does one do to kind of train themselves up for this moment? Um, and, and that said, knowing that, a woman's body and a woman's spirit and, and that of a man too, I'm sure in some capacity kind of already knows what to do because you and I wouldn't be here recording a podcast if the humans that came before us didn't figure it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was a time when, I don't know, maybe you had a, a medicine person in the tribe that might've assisted with it. But up until probably a few hundred years ago, people are just popping babies out left and right. And I'm sure some of them made it and some of them didn't. Uh, but the fact is, here we are. So that speaks to me, um, just looking from a historical perspective. But what if one's not going to kind of rally the troops and really just freestyle it, what sort of education goes into feeling comfortable with that and feeling confident in, in your body and soul's innate ability to bring forth life? Mm. Yeah, I, I actually, I love the way you put that, Luke, um, because I think that it really does come down to the degree of, of confidence and comfort that a woman feels. And I think for, for most of us, uh, for most of us living in this contemporary culture, I think that we have a lot of deprogramming to do. So I think the most significant work for most of us isn't necessarily learning but it, 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 it looks like learning because it's, it's unlearning. So I think we have to kind of learn to unlearn, right? No, um, no and that's absolutely what happened in my case. Um, actually, to kind of dovetail off of my, my miscarriage story, I ended up getting pregnant again uh, or finding out that I was pregnant again two weeks after that miscarriage. And so... You know, I was kind of in the position maybe that 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 you are, you and your partner are in a way in that I was doing this thing. Um, I understand that that you're not you're not pregnant yet, but you're kind of thinking about it. Um, and uh, because I'd had that kind of dramatic, um, monumental experience of realizing that that I was going to make choices that were very very different from the the so called mainstream, uh, I did end up delving into a process of, um, of kind of obsessive uh, learning. And so I read every single book that I could get my hands on, um, both from the mainstream and also alternative uh, books. And this was um, actually, this was at the very beginning of, of the internet. And, and, and it, it sadly, uh, I think there was a lot more alternative information available than, than there is now because we're, we're, we're experiencing so much censorship. And, and it's actually, I find it very difficult to find um, really juicy, interesting alternative information online in, in many ways now. But, um, but I, I would say that what is required for a woman to feel comfortable making a choice to, to freestyle it, as you said, um, is just entirely based on her 
outlook, perspective, constitution. And I've worked with some women who have said, you know, I don't feel the need to read anything. I'm going to spend my pregnancy meditating and sitting in the forest. And I feel like I will know what to do when my birth time comes. And we do because we are animals and we do actually possess within, within each of our, ourselves the innate knowledge and wisdom of, of how to do this. It, we, we, none of us give birth with our intellect or our discernment or, you know, our, or anything like that. We, we give birth with our instinct and, um, and birth works really, really well when no one is sabotaging it. So in terms of kind of what to know, really, really, I mean, in terms of what to know, I think the most important thing, the most important things to know are probably how to not, how to not interfere inappropriately and how to not mess things up. And this is again, why, um, you know, when I'm teaching childbirth education or when I'm doing coaching with families, for the most part, um, for the most part, people really do want want so-called knowledge and education but again it's it's more of it's more of a re-remembering than than a like here is all the information you must know like i i've i've worked with quite a few families who who come to me initially and and they say okay like what are the books we have to like da, da, da. and it's like no 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 you're not going to you know train yourself to be like a junior obstetrician during this pregnancy time like we're going to sink into what does birth mean and how does it actually work and what goes on in our bodies when when this process is unfolding and what can we do for ourselves and what can your partner do to optimally support maintaining an environment and an atmosphere that is going to be most conducive to this process unfolding as perfectly as it wants to right wow. so wow that's beautiful. I love your perspective. You're so awesome. It reminds me of uh, God. There's just <laughs> again, there's so much there. Somehow I came across a video. I think my dad, you know, my dad's like a boomer, so he emails me these funny videos. You know, like you know, the older people that that you're on this thread and it's been forwarded like 85 times. Those type of videos, just random stuff. But he he sent me a video of. Um, it was a bunch of videos like in this thread of, of a boomer email thread. And in one of the videos, there was an elephant calf being born. I think they're a calf. And it was so fascinating to see there was a, a group of these elephants around uh, all adults, massive adults. And then you could kind of see the, the calf you know, emerge. And then the big badass bulls, I think, um, then kind of formed a perimeter around the little birthing area. And then um, the females started to come up and just like uh, somewhat violently nudge this calf and like push it around in the dirt and kind of flip it over. And, you know, you're kind of going, what's going on? What kind of video did I get here? Are they going to stomp on this thing? You know, like they're trying to thin the herd or what? Uh, And then, you know, after a number of these uh, interventions that they just instinctively knew to do. Then within two minutes, this calf is up and walks across the little road in Africa, right? Uh, and that's what your story reminds me of. It's like those elephants didn't need to read a book about, you know, how to not stomp the calf and how to roll it over properly and how to extend your, uh, you know, your trunk, um, you know, to the the right, um, you know, angle and these kind of things. Um, and I think it's so interesting and, and also really, from one point of view, kind of sad that humans have grown to view ourselves as apart from the living natural world and that we're somehow, uh, as you indicated, that we're animals, that somehow we're not animals and that we don't possess the same innate skill set as those elephants. So therefore, we have to look up and seek to some authority, be it a, a, a white, you know, smock or uh, otherwise to kind of teach us and show us what to do. And I just, I find this so fascinating, especially as I said earlier that I'm, I'm seeing it within myself. I'm like, well, I don't know what to do. I'm disconnected from it. And I think I'm Mr. Live Free and Natural, you know? So it's just, it's a really interesting self-inquiry, I think, for people to really consider 
uh, how distant we've placed ourselves from who and what we really are as this sort of um, dominionistic relationship we have with the natural world and, and the animals and other creatures of the world and how we view ourselves as superior in many ways. Yet at the same time, we diminish <laughs> what makes us equal, right? And that's that innate ability to tap into one's own body and natural resources um, to do something as seemingly simple as birth. I mean, if there's, if there's anything more uh, innately natural than, than procreating and bringing life into the world, I don't know what it is, right? I mean, maybe eating, drinking water, having babies. And why do we find it such a foreign experience? And it, it has to be, as you said, is unlearning all of that programming. And I really love that perspective too, because something I've discovered for myself in my own spiritual unfolding and um, exploration of consciousness is that it's probably had a lot, and I've come a long way. I mean, there's always room to grow, but I've come a long way in the years uh, that I've been working on this. But I would say there's been more unlearning than there has been learning, right? The unlearning is the learning. It's, it's not about like getting more information or learning more about spirituality or my true self, my true nature, but really in discarding all of those falsehoods that make up something other than me, right? And, and discarding these false constructs. So your perspective on that is just brilliant. Um, I'm so enjoying this conversation. I could go on forever. This might be a long podcast. I hope you have time. <laughs> I just like each time you talk, I'm like, there's a whole podcast, a, a third, fourth, fifth, sixth episode right there. It really, it's really <laughs> fun. Um, so, oh God, man, there's so many directions here. I guess what are some of the most, what are some of the most impactful steps? Say someone wants to go forward with this and they resonate and they're like, wow, yeah, we really do know what to do. I'm, I'm about to be a mom or a dad and let's just let this happen as, as nature designed. What are some of the most important ways other than studying the books and feeling like you have to learn? What are some of the most mm, practical ways that, that, a family can kind of lean into this perspective and allow a pregnancy and a birth to unfold in the ways that you describe? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think this, this actually relates to, to what I was just mentioning before. Like, and I, I want to say that, and I, I think this is really important. I actually think that most, most women probably aren't going to want a, f a free birth in the sort of technical definition or, or according to, to my definition of what that means. I think most women do really deeply want a trusted, wise woman to, to support them and, and walk with them. And I think one of the, the, the sort of unfortunate, I think, reasons that some women choose free birth is because they can't find that the kind of uh, uh, appropriate uh, support that they're looking for. They can't find the kind of support that they're looking for. And so I want to just, yeah, just acknowledge that, that I think free birth has sort of, it's kind of achieved a sort of mm, a kind of a bit of a cultural fascination a bit of a sort of cachet. And I think people almost see it as, um, you know, the most extreme way to give birth. And I don't think, I don't see it as a, as a, as having any kind of superior hierarchical value over choosing a birth that is supported by, um, you know, either a midwife or, or a traditional birth attendant. But in terms of um, the steps that I would encourage a mother and a family to take um, when they're exploring birth choices, uh, steps that I think are important in terms of um, yeah, leading to a positive outcome. I would say, first of all, really knowing exactly what you want. Um, and that sounds maybe simplistic, but I think a lot of people uh, have kind of an idea of the kind of birth they think they might be interested in. But I see a lot of people then making choices that are not in alignment with that uh, apparent desire, if that makes sense. So I think really, really 
getting to know yourself and and what you truly value is is very very important. I also think that if you do know very clearly that you do want to have a birth that um, is outside of the the sort of medical model. I would say that one of the most important factors that contributes to a positive outcome would be really cultivating mental fortitude. So giving birth is the most wildly intense, shockingly intense, um, sometimes excruciating, uh, totally all-encompassing experience. Um, It's just the most intense experience that is possible for us as adult humans um, and also babies, obviously. Uh, there really is nothing else like it. I think that um, the, the, uh, the extremity of birth goes far beyond any kind of plant medicine experience that we can possibly have. Um, Did that include uh, Bufo Alvarius? <laughs> 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 well, I, I just I just did 5-MeO-DMT um, a few weeks ago. I, I did it a couple of times and um, the parallels are, are, are really quite striking. Um, and both are, both are intense in their own way, but gosh, what an interesting, what an interesting parallel. Um, and in fact, um, you probably already know this, Luke, but, um, uh, you know, Birth is, is it's it's the portal, you know, through which we as human beings first encounter uh, the very concept of of self, right? Uh, and birth is our first experience of life on Earth. And what takes place during birth is this process of deep imprinting on every possible level of awareness, right? Including the physical, the psychological, the hormonal, the chemical, and also the spiritual and energetic, um, and and electrical. Um, and so, moving through our mother's bodies is designed to be the peak experience of connection and love and bliss that is possible for a person to experience, mother and baby. And and birth establishes our baseline in terms of our instinctive self-concept. I mean, this is my my take on it, right? Uh, And I think that this is true both for the new being, for the infant incarnating on earth, through the kind of transubstantiation of birth, but also it's true for mothers because we also are reborn through this, this ecstatic experience of birth, which, which binds us to our babies as their bodies pass through ours. Um, and that process of emerging through a mother's body triggers hormone receptors and, and meridian points in our vaginas that activate the secretion of not only oxytocin, which is the hormone of love and attachment, but also 5-MeO-dimethyltryptamine, uh, known as the God molecule. Yeah. Um, wow, and so, I didn't know that. Yeah. 5-MeO-DMT mm-hmm. uh, DMT is, is excreted at birth, death, and orgasm. Um, and as you and your listeners probably know, 5-MeO uh, is, is a psychedelic many times more powerful than ayahuasca. Um, and, uh, and our babies too are experiencing this ecstatic explosion of pure light and love, literally. Um, and I, I feel so emotional talking about this because like I said, you know, the vast majority of people walking around this beautiful planet of ours right now have been, I think, actively and deliberately deprived of this experience of foundational connection because the vast majority of mothers or babies are overtly and actively abused and tortured during the birth process. And this happens most often in the hospital, but it also happens at home on account of the medical appropriation of grassroots independent midwifery um, that has, I think, really served to bring into most home birth situations uh, with midwives who've been trained according to this paradigm, exactly the kind of direct sabotage of the birth process that has become standardized within hospital systems. And so uh, I think um, in many ways, 
midwifery is a branch of the industrial medical system now. Um, and, and midwifery regulation has kind of worked as, as a bit of a Trojan horse and it's really, really shifted the landscape of birth. So I know I've kind of touched on a whole bunch of different things there, but, um, but many, many women are now choosing free birth, like I said, because they're ha- having a really hard time finding the kind of holistic support that I think many people still think of when we hear the word midwifery. But that sort of really holistic birth is not a medical event, uh, you know, grassroots independent midwifery has been largely stamped out all over the world. Um, and this is another expression of the same gesture of domination and control that we see in all these other areas of life. So uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that now. No, that's, but... <laughs> that's great. I know, I know where I'm going with it. A couple of different places in speaking you, to you today. And, and I don't know, I think I've just had this innate sense and it probably has to do with just being so in love uh, with such an incredible, brilliant, just being of light that I'm so fortunate to be blessed with. But it's like the prospect of having a kid to me is seemingly morphing into um, (laughs) not so much like the intention of like wanting to have a kid running around. That's part of it, but that that's almost more novel in a sense. I think what draws me nearer to this experience in my life, um, again, because there's someone to hold that space with is the, spiritual nature of the birth experience itself. And going back to the 5-MeO-DMT experience, um, there's an interesting correlation there that I'd like to maybe explore later, but there's, there's more, to know, more work for us to do right here. Ah, oh God, how do I sew this together? Okay, I went on a hunting trip recently here in Texas. Uh, first time since I was a little kid and really the first time having a very conscious experience of that. And I killed an animal um, right away. First night out, boom, first shot, giant wild boar uh, died in front of me, you know, ran up and um, I'm doing a podcast on it. So those listening will know that that's coming. Um, But how it ties into this is that in that moment, there was this super crazy, luminous, almost psychedelic, uh, not even a feeling, just like a field that was present in that experience between me and the spirit of that animal vacating into wherever that spirit goes to or as it's absorbed back into the field of consciousness or whatever happens. And, um, and it was very similar actually to a 5-MEO experience in that just everything got ethereal and weird and it was just like took over my whole being. I mean, it was a really powerful experience and one that I thankfully was really able to remain present for and to really just bathe in and absorb, um, not from any intellectual construct at all, but just God was there in that moment. And it was so um, apparent that, that that portal between worlds was open for a few moments. And I've opened that portal with the assistance of things like 5MEO uh, a lot. And um, I know what it feels like when you're kind of going interdimensional and um, entering into those spaces that aren't normally perceivable through your senses. And I somehow knew in that moment, or at least I intuited so, that that's part of what happens in a birth experience. And it was just, it was so heavy. But rather than, um, I don't know, rather than being more afraid, because historically I was, I had a lot of fear around having kids and just, you know, birth and the whole thing was just like, I don't know if I'm built for that really, you know, just due to the circumstances of my 
earlier life and childhood and stuff that we alluded to before. Um, but there was this, this leaning into that and even more curiosity around the energetics of birth and death. And that having that visceral experience of death seemed in the moment. And again, I haven't been present for a birth (laughs) other than my own, which I don't remember much of. It seemed that they were one in the same. That's what I'm getting at. And so there was like, (laughs) there appeared to be kind of a missing experience in my life. It was like, that's something that I need to experience as part of my own evolution and the full expression of an incarnate soul here during this time. So when you speak about it in that way, like all of those, all of those past experiences kind of come to mind. And there's this inner knowing that that portal is something that just must be experienced uh, to be full, at least for me, to be a fully integrated being here and to, um, to not at least explore the possibilities if it's within the will of the creator for it to be so, uh, to really open up to that experience in a, in a different way. And, um, you know, I don't know that there's a question there or if it's just a share of an experience, probably a little of both, but I guess maybe the question born out of that experience was, um, do you view the death and birth portal as, as one in the same as a, a passageway between worlds of sorts? Absolutely. I do. And I actually felt very moved hearing your description of feeling the presence of God in this experience of honoring the animal that you killed, Luke. And as you were talking, I I just, a sort of parallel came to me. And I suspect that you may not have had access to that experience of transcendence in at least not in the same way had you made an appointment to go and visit a factory farm where thousands of pigs are held close together and then you'd gone into the slaughter room and you know observed as they were being dealt with in that industrial space. And I think that there are a lot of important similarities there between, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not the perfect analogy by any means, but um, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that I think it's very, very difficult to access the kind of transcendental experience um, that is available to us in birth when the experience is being mediated by these industrial systems that really take us out of our bodies. And, you know, there are so many reasons why I choose to give birth to my babies at home. But I've also resolved or decided that I will die at home. I have no interest in dying in the hospital, if, if that's at all possible. Um, and I think, again, when it comes to birth, it's not just that the hospital environment is impersonal and sterile and, you know, maybe unpleasant for some people. It's that being in that environment has a direct physiological effect on how our bodies function. Um, especially as 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 birthing mothers, so it's not just a preference. You know, we hear a lot about um, I don't know. People have lots of opinions about about home birth and free birth and all of these alternative so, so called alternative birth choices. Although, in 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 truth, taking ourselves out of our homes and and going into uh, a sterile institution is that's the alternative birth choice. I mean, for millennia, as you pointed out, you know, we've always been birthing at home um, and women supporting each other. Uh, in our communities at home. Um, But birth really does push us to our absolute limits and and then beyond what we think those limits might be. Um, So I went into my first birth experience at the age of 20, um, 
and it was, was a home birth. Uh, uh, and it, that's a long story that I won't get into, but I had initially hired a, a regulated, you know, official licensed midwife and quickly realized that she didn't work for me. She, she worked for the state. And so she was obligated to, to kind of do all sorts of things and to pressure me into all sorts of things that I wasn't comfortable with. So I eventually um, let go of that relationship and found an illegal underground midwife or traditional birth attendant. And, um, and that was one of the best decisions that I have made in my life. Um, because looking back, if I hadn't had that woman present with me who was truly there for me in every capacity um, and who I had hired and I, 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 you know, I borrowed money at the age of 20 and, um, you know, made sure that I, I could secure her, her services. Um, I definitely would have ended up with a C-section in the hospital. I have no doubt about that whatsoever, because at every point in my experience, it was not what I thought it was going to be. And it was far, far more intense and, and just far more everything than I could possibly have have suspected. Um, and I really went into it thinking that this was going to be a walk in the park because, you know, I'm super smart and I'm super courageous. And I told myself that I had way more grit than most other women. I'm like, this is just not even going to be a big deal. Um, and it absolutely rocked me to my core. and. I think what's so shocking about birth that a lot of women don't necessarily anticipate is that like many experiences with plant medicine, uh, giving birth requires demands of us, a kind of ego death. Um, Birth demands that we uh, submit whether we like it or not, to this kind of systematic stripping away of every layer of who we are, every form of kind of self-conceptualization that we've been carrying around has to go. Um, And it's not until we surrender um, that we allow ourselves to kind of be exalted to a point that we kind of return to this primal state of being kind of this just naked, screaming, weeping animal. Uh, I mean, you know, animal in the most divine sense. It's, It's a return to the very most core essence of who we are, um, the sort of beautiful wildness of who we are. And it's not until we can get to that place that we're then actually ready to allow ourselves to you know, move our babies through our bodies. Um, and I think coming to terms with this is probably one of the most important factors. Um, and what that looks like is doing things, I think, like you know, having a regular daily meditation practice and you know, cultivating mind-body awareness and spending as much time as possible in nature, in the forest, away from digital distractions and, and really working on your mental fortitude. Um, uh, and I would say the same for, for a partner as well because uh, there's a huge difference between going to the hospital where the woman that you love, where, where you will be in a position of having to watch, like you're, you're watching the woman that you love have things done to her, right? As opposed to supporting the woman that you love as she embodies her most glorious, most powerful self. It's a very, very different experience, right? Um, Because yes, you know, birth is a physical experience, obviously it's very physical, but I think far more significantly, it's a mental and emotional and psychological and spiritual experience because the mind gives up far before the body does, right? And so barring true emergency situations, which are, again, extremely rare when birth is not being actively sabotaged. And it's also a really good idea to kind of understand what that looks like. What, like how, how can we sabotage birth? Because most of us don't really understand the physiology of birth, 
right? And so it is very easy to sabotage the birth process because actually, hmm, this is maybe a controversial thing to, to claim, but I would say that that doctors and nurses and health professionals are the least well-versed in what spontaneous physiological birth actually looks like. They have no context for that. They have absolutely no clue what that could possibly even look like. They just have no experience in that. Um, so yeah, barring uh, uh, true emergency situations, which are very few and far between when no one is sort of messing with this, this incredible design, um, most women who are planning home births and who end up transferring to the hospital do so because they are mentally exhausted and, and overwhelmed with fear. Um, so I would also say that, you know, working on, um, on our fears and uh, yeah, really delving into that and working on our own birth trauma uh, is also a really important aspect of, of getting what we want in our births. Wow, that's huge. Uh, and going back to your analogy of the factory farm pigs, um, honestly, that's how, I, that's how I already view the medical system. And, you know, that said, if I get hit by a bus and break my femur, please take me to the hospital. Like, don't try to rub some herbs on it. You know what I mean? I'm not an idiot, but I think that this dependency that we have on, on this system that we've created or have really perhaps has been created for us or to us um, more likely is just another example of how we allow ourselves to be disempowered and Going back to the analogy of how things happen truly in nature, not the not the co-opted word nature like natural granola, granola bar, but true true nature. Um, you know, animals don't need hospitals, right? Uh, because they're living in their natural environment. And I'm always harping on this that I think all, I mean, maybe not all, but most of human pathology on the spiritual, emotional, psychological, mental, physical realm can be traced back to us moving indoors and domesticating ourselves, right? And when we divorce ourselves from our natural life ways, pathology ensues. But we're so in the middle of it and humans are so myopic in our perspective that we don't see how abnormal it is that there's massive hospital buildings all around for people that are sick and what made them sick, basically just not being outdoors. <laughs> like, honestly, you know, it's like... We're eating fake food under fake light with fake, um, you know, a, a fake electromagnetic spectrum surrounding us and invading us on every level of our cells. Um, remove all of that and put us back fifteen thousand years pre agriculture as hunter gatherers, and there, there's no hospitals. There's a medicine person in the tribe, and you know they have their herbs and their magic, and they sort you out or they don't, and you don't make it, and then you know your gene pool is kind of wiped out and and so on, right? I mean, not to be cold about it, but it really is just the way that nature is designed. So I, I really um, actually very much resonate with that perspective because I just don't see how birth is the same as being sick. It just doesn't make sense. Just zoom out for two seconds, anyone listening. Like, is a woman ill because she's pregnant? No. You're the opposite of ill. <laughs> like you're very well if you're pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. You've come to term. Like you're doing great. You're not sick. Why would you go to a hospital, right? I mean, I would have to be deathly ill to go to a hospital personally. I'm going to do everything I can to fix it. Uh, and thankfully, I've you know learned a lot and have a lot of resources to sort myself out most of the time. But I just think this conversation is such an important one. And I, um, yeah, I really applaud you for your your courage. I'm sure that it's it's not an easy voice to have uh, because of the deep indoctrination and bias that we've been programmed with. And, and some of that, as I said, that's come up within me even during this conversation. And I think I'm as anti-traditional as it gets, but I'm not because there's things that have just been embedded within my awareness that are mm -hmm. still at play to just think like, you can't just do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what, what if something happens? Um, so to that point, what would be something that could take place in a free birth that would 
necessitate sounding the alarm, hopping in a car and getting your ass to a hospital and turning yourself over to the white coats and, um, you know, submitting to their attempts to revive the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And that's, you know, one of the, one of the kind of top questions, right? What if something goes wrong? Well, uh, what you just described is, is certainly an option for, for most women, you know? And I think there is, there is a, a prevalent myth that abounds that birth is so fraught with danger that, you know, at any point, suddenly everyone could just sort of perish. And, and, and there, there must be, you know, a multitude of, 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 of possible incidents during a birth where all of a sudden, if you don't get to the hospital in the next five minutes, things are going to just devolve completely. And there are situations like that once in a blue moon, but they're very, very rare. Um, for the most part, something going wrong looks like a situation where that comes up where there may be certain pieces of evidence that we notice, that the mother notices, that don't seem right. And in the vast majority of situations that might in fact benefit from a transfer to the hospital, there's usually time to kind of think about things and, and sort of make an assessment. And like I said before, most of the transfers that occur during planned home births are situations like that, where the mother feels exhausted and discouraged and maybe starts to tell herself a story that the baby's stuck or that there's something wrong. Um, and she might decide to transfer. Um, but those kind of immediately emergent life or death within five minutes kinds of situations are both incredibly rare and usually in the vast majority of cases, I mean, I can't actually think of a situation like that that would be like five minutes to the hospital right now that wouldn't present with incredibly clear evidence of a problem. So I'm thinking situations like uh, placental abruption, which is when the placenta shears away from the wall of a mother's uterus prior to the baby being born and can result in, in, in serious hemorrhage. So that kind of a situation, that's going to present with blood coming out of the mother's body in a way that she will know immediately this is not right. Anyone present would know immediately something's not right. And then you go in right? And you seek help. It's kind of like, I mean, I, I think it is very much a fair analogy to make that, um, or a, a comparison. Um, and actually, I do think this is very true. Statistically, we are in far more serious potential peril getting into our cars and driving to the grocery store, right? I mean, statistically, it's incredibly dangerous to get into a little metal box on wheels with a big, you know, hefty motor and propel ourselves through the streets at breakneck speeds. That's crazy. And yet it's been so normalized in our culture that we don't even think twice about it. And nobody, no one that I know anyway, prior to getting to their car to drive into the grocery store, calls the hospital ahead of time just to make sure that they know that we're going to be heading out and has an emergency, you know, kit with them and you know, like it just, we, we don't, we don't work that way because we've just been enculturated to believe that like driving is normal, right? But birth is not normal. And so we fear it. Um, but the truth is that sometimes people die. Actually, always people die. <laughs> We're all going to die. Uh, and sometimes babies die during birth or prior to birth. Um, and this happens in the hospital and this happens in birth centers and it happens at home. And so I think one of the reasons that uh, people are uh, 
so afraid of, of home birth in particular and free birth, especially is because again, we have been, um, kind of, I think programmed to believe that, um, that the allopathic system and, and, and industrial obstetrics in particular, uh, has, is responsible for dramatically decreasing the, the, the number of babies who die and in dramatically increasing our, our, our you know, life expectancy, the, the maternal child health outcomes, et cetera. And actually, I don't think that's true. Uh, and when you look at um, some really interesting studies that have been done over the years, uh, comparing hospital and home births, and in particular, it was a, a Cochrane review that was done on, on the sort of, uh, on comparing several studies on the safety of, safety of, of home birth and, and hospital birth. Um, they're pretty much on par. Um, but again, None of those studies have included birth outside of uh, some form of institutional um, observation, right? So uh, it's actually not possible to study uh, free birth or, or wild birth because the point of it is that it's not part of the institution at all. Um, and I'm less and less interested personally in statistics and scientific studies, because I think one of the really important points to think about is that um, what the industrial allopathic and obstetric system does is it kind of, it assumes that it, the system, holds a monopoly on safety and risk on what constitutes safety and risk. So it kind of homogenizes this idea of what safety and risk are, uh, and it standardizes what safety and risk are, and it institutionalizes what safety and risk are. But the reality is that safety and risk are very, very subjective concepts. So what is safe for me and risky for me is informed by my life experiences and my worldview and my spiritual perspective. And I look at what happens in the hospital and all of the safety measures that are put in place. And that is the most dangerous place for me to be. It's the most dangerous place for my children to be. And during each of my pregnancies, I definitely experience fear. You know, I go through all of the same fears that I think every woman experiences. What if my baby dies? Um, what if my baby is born with serious developmental issues? Um, you know, I don't participate in... Sorry. Uh, I don't participate in, in industrial prenatal, prenatal care at all. Um, um, I, I, I don't have anything to do with it. Um, now, I see industrial prenatal care not as true care um, in any way, but as the kind of performance of an occult ritual. You know, I, in effect, uh, I actually <laughs> see it as a as a form of of, of ritual humiliation. Uh, you know, I think similar in many ways to the whole masquerade that's happening right now, um, in that the the kind of discreet processes and procedures that make up the performance of prenatal care actually have little to no concrete benefit to the mother or baby whatsoever. Like not even any scientific or scientistic benefit. You know, when you actually delve into like, oh, what is, what, what, what are we doing when the doctor you know, puts his hands up inside of a woman's vagina and like feels around there. Like where, where's the literature that supports this? There isn't any, it, none of it actually has any substance to it. Um, and yet these processes, processes and procedures do absolutely serve a very, very powerful purpose. And that purpose is as a, a hazing ritual. So as I see it, the objective of the industrial prenatal care system is to reinforce to the mother in as many ways as possible the idea that, that she has no power in this pregnancy, no real authority over her body or her baby, uh, 
no real possible insight into anything that's going on in her body in terms of, you know, contributing to the life of this baby outside of the, the sort of base mechanics of what she kind of puts into her body and, and very little of substance to offer in terms of how this pregnancy and birth will play out other than as this kind of sort of dumb live mannequin vessel, right? For this child, which is through these ritualized procedures, essentially being claimed by the institution uh, in preparation for a life in service to all of these institutions, right? And so I don't do that. I don't want any part of that. And I, I do think that making the choice to become pregnant and to have a child um, always involves a kind of reckoning with, with life and death. Um, but the difference when we choose to give birth outside of the system is that a large portion of the world will see you as a dangerous dissident and a bad mother. Whereas if you are in alignment with those systems or, or you submit yourself to um, this industrial uh, allopathic system, then you are seen by most of the world as a good mother. But the risk of death is ever present, no matter what choice we make. And when it comes down to it, for me, um, I, I know that I'm, I'm safer at home. And, and I, I accept the, uh, whatever, whatever comes. Um, and I also actually feel, um, and this is a very controversial, I know, but I feel like, uh, like I have a right to welcome my child into the peace and serenity and quietude and, and love of my home environment. And that's what I want for all of my children, whatever their situation at birth. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> the question that comes to mind um, when I hear your perspective, which just makes so much common sense to me, this is so normal and not out, outlandish, you know, as much as I've had to work through a little of my own programming, where are the feminists on this? You know, like, am I, am I, am I just not, you know, not like I'm that tapped in. I'm obviously a male. Like I, I don't know about many women's issues, but I, I got social media. I see a lot of rallies about, you know, we want to have more abortions and the people are very, uh, seem there's a certain sect of, I guess they would consider themselves feminists that are really, really up in arms about any threat to their right to abortion, my body, my choice, all of this. But why is this and is it true that this particular perspective is kind of ignored by that movement? Like what you're describing is the utmost violation of the divine feminine of women the world over. I mean, I hear the word patriarchy thrown about. I, Again, being a male, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by that in certain cases, um, other than you know the obvious that there seems to be more men in charge and they're fucking things up pretty bad, <laughs> generally speaking, in the way our most societies are, are formed and, and those that put themselves in charge. Um, you know, uh, But it's like... Why aren't there people marching in the streets with my body, my choice for what you just said, that it's my body, I'm pregnant, this is my baby, God and the sperm donor gave it to me and I'm going to do what I want with it. Like, why are women not fighting for that or are they? Well, I'm over here and, and I got a couple of friends who are, <laughs> who are on <laughs> side. <laughs> But you're right. It's uh, it, this is an issue that is, I think, a major, major blind spot um, when it comes to most uh, most feminist, I don't know, groups, organizations. And I mean, I I 
prior to this year, Luke, I would have described myself as, as quite a ferocious radical feminist. And um, I, I mean, I, 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 I haven't entirely disavowed the, the sort of feminist label in every way, but I'm less enthusiastic about it at this, at this stage, in part because the thing that defines us as, as women, which is our capacity to gestate and give birth to our babies and to sustain them with our bodies, uh, tends to be one of the things that, again, is, is one of these major blind spots. And I think it actually comes down to this, the same kind of, of trauma bonding that I think is present for, for most people. I think that most people have been so profoundly traumatized that to entertain the idea that what was done to them at birth or, or during their experiences of birth in the case of many mothers, to entertain the possibility that that was wrong <clears throat> would cause such a such a rift kind of in their in their worldview that and, and so much cognitive dissonance and it would cause them to to question so many other institutions as well that are related to so-called healthcare uh, that I think it's too painful for a lot of people to to face honestly um, and I think in in so many feminist circles over so many years, we have been sold, you know, feminists were sold this idea that, you know, the birth control pill is liberation, that the epidural is liberation, that liberation is to be freed from the shackles of the pain and the torture and the horrors of birth. Uh, and so there's just so much work to be done, I think, to uh yeah, to to uh, to to re redesign, re reconfigure some of these these ideas. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really interesting phenomenon. That, Absolutely, that, it really is. It's it's got me scratching my head as, as you're speaking. I'm thinking, you know, from the outside, and again, I don't know this to be true, but just what I observe in the periphery of media is. There seem to be a lot more women fighting for the right to kill babies than the right to have them. I think that's rather strange. I really do. And nothing against like women that have chosen that. I have unfortunately participated in a couple abortions myself, and it's something that I've had to do a lot of work around, and it's been a um, very difficult shadow to face. Um, so no shame there, but it is just, you know, again, zooming out as a social observation, it, it is strange because I think um, the points that you've made today are really just so inherently true and valuable. I'm like, come on people. And you know, maybe it is, maybe it's us men, maybe it is the patriarchy and people like me that provide a platform for you to say like, hey, wake up, like everyone wake up, right? Whether you're feminist or whatever ist, um, I think that this is something that's just really important for us to um, to do. And it's why I wanted to do this show with you. And I, I already have a few more in the pipeline uh, around this topic because, um, you know, I just, again, going back to what, what we see in the world now and the power structure that we see and its kind of death grip on humanity, the only way out of that, I think, is in birthing conscious superhero babies that are of a new paradigm of the human experience and perhaps the portal that you're opening for your kids and helping other families to uh, open as well is part of that. And I, I think it is, I really think it is of undoing the, you know, the traumatic cycles that tend to um, make us more unconscious. And, and to the point of the cognitive dissonance, there's another observation I want to point to. And that is when I've been outspoken about um, my disdain for circumcision as a medical practice, having been someone who lived through it, um, I've never seen any pushback from women. It's always from men and I haven't seen their dicks, so I'm not sure, but I'm guessing they're men who were circumcised. I mean, talk about cognitive dissonance and it goes back to what you're saying. Like, I don't even want to face that that could have been wrong or that it could have harmed me or shaped the ways in which I interact sexually or my sensitivities or lack thereof physically, emotionally, spiritually with my sexual partners 
it's not an easy thing to face. And so I, I can see why women are just like, ah, close that door. Let's focus on other women's rights issues that are kind of lower hanging fruit and don't perhaps cause us to go within and really face the depth of deception and harm that's been perpetrated on, on us. So it's, um, man, what a wild conversation. Holy shit. Woo. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a doozy, but man, I'm just like, whew, my heart is singing. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Luke. This has been, yeah, an amazing conversation. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. What else are you going to talk about? You know, Sometimes I have a hard time socializing because I just want to go into this shit. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> oh, what a, the weather's clearing up. Isn't it nice? I'm just like, I get me out of here. Like, guys... There's so many more interesting things in the human experience to explore and, 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 and even more so not only to explore, but to form solutions around, you know, and not that your solution or my solution is the right solution, but it is a solution, right? Um, which is going to be right and resonate for some people. And um, in closing, I also want to give, again, as I did in the beginning, a, a shout out of support to any um parents out there that are hearing this going like, oh my God, I screwed up. I went to the hospital and that, you know, it's like we do the best we can with whatever information we're given. Right. I mean, I know I love my parents so much. I don't hold anything against them for any of the mistakes they made, the ways in which I was born, raised, whatever. Um, I'm grateful for all of it. And, and you have to kind of bring in, I think to make sense of all this karma too, right? It's, it was obviously God's will that I was born in the way in which I was born. How do I know that? Because that's what happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> so it's like everything happens according to this grand scheme and this grand plan. And um, it's only in hindsight often that we look back and go, oh, if there was just one pivotal decision made uh, in another direction, it would have changed so many outcomes. But the fact is they weren't. And so now we learn, we observe and... Um, Perhaps we make informed choices uh, for the future generations that have different outcomes. And then our kids someday will be pissed about us about something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> my, kid, my kids are going to be pissed. I'm never going to let them have an iPad or be around Wi-Fi. You know, like I already, I already see, you know, the, the trajectory of uh, my future kids if they choose to show up. And um, I'm sure that I'm going to make so many mistakes and hopefully I'll be forgiven as I've forgiven mine. Um, Cause you know, we're all doing the best we can. So again, to the parents out there, you know, um, keep an open mind and an open heart and, um, and know that uh, we love you no matter what choices you made in the past or choose to make tomorrow. You know, I think it's um, inclusivity is really an important thing here. And uh, your message really, um, really does a great job of doing that in a really open hearted way. So thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. With that, I've got one more question for you. Who are three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life or your work that you'd like to share with us? Oh, my goodness. Well, I would say my colleague and, and business partner, Emily Saldea, who I uh, co-wrote and created... Um, one of our amazing online courses with, which is called The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Um, and I also created with Emily and, and co-teach with her the Radical Birth Keeper School, which is an online education program that actually teaches women how to step into the role of authentic midwife in their communities. Um, yeah, Emily has been just an amazing teacher and sister to me. And I think you know, sisterhood in general is just such an important thing. Brotherhood to community, really. Um, but in the context of my own birth experiences and learning about birth and connecting with other women in regards to birth, um, yeah, that that kind of connection has been invaluable. And and Emily is an amazing woman, and another another woman who is is an expert in this in this area. That uh, yeah, you might want to reach out to because she's amazing. Is she the Free Birth Society woman? She uh, is. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've had my eye on her as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit her up. She's amazing. She would be an incredible guest. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Done. I'm definitely. She's, she's fantastic. And she's, she's changed my life in so many ways. Um, and then I would also name Gloria LeMay. Uh, Gloria LeMay is, um, is my midwife. Um, she was my midwife uh, during my first birth. 
And um, <clears throat> she completely changed my life because she trusted me um, as a 20 year old, newly pregnant mother. And, um, and she just completely, yeah, she, she, she changed my life so much because what I saw in her during our first meeting was a woman who trusted me enough to tell me the truth and to tell me her unadulterated opinion and then to support me in whatever choice I ended up making. Uh, and that was so radical. And I think it's still very radical because, again, the kind of paradigm that we're living in right now suggests that, um, especially in the context of birth, a midwife's role is to be unbiased and uh, you know, to support the informed consent of their blah, blah, blah. And I think it's very dishonest to claim a lack of bias uh, in, in, in many realms, but uh, in birth especially. Um, and I approach my own birth work, uh, my work as, as, a, uh, as a birth witness um, in a similar way uh, to, in the same way as Gloria, I should say. I mean, she completely inspired um, me uh, in the work that I do. And I'm completely upfront and honest with my clients about my credentials, my experience, and the fact that I am incredibly biased. And I also will always support the choice that my clients make. But I want people to come to me because they know that I'm going to be unafraid to speak what I know to be true. Uh, and so that was such an important. Uh, experience that I had um, learning from Gloria and and she's she's still one of my my dearest friends and mentors to this day so Gloria LeMay and now I have to come up with a third oh dear um, I would say my husband because he is just the sweetest loveliest person that I've ever known and the very first thing I said to him well, maybe not maybe not technically the very first, one of the first things that I said to him on our first date was, just so you know, if we're going to be together and have children, I give birth at home. Are you okay with that? Or what do you think about that? And he said, huh, well, I've never really thought of that before, but I guess you should just do whatever you feel comfortable doing. And he passed. He passed the test and he has been just, yeah, my, he is my divine life partner. And I feel so lucky to have him in my life and I adore him. And yeah, he's, he's one of the, one of the most serene um, and centered people that I know. And I am still striving to learn from him <laughs> and to not get too worked up about things. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Uh, and where can people find you online, social media, etc.? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I, I do a lot of stuff, I guess, on Instagram. And I'm at Bahouswife on Instagram. Uh, and I have a website at www.freebirth.ca. Um, and as I mentioned, I do a lot of projects with Emily Salde at Free Birth Society. And I'm just about to launch a new program, which is a 10 week live with me, deep dive kind of mastermind childbirth education experience for all expectant parents, um, during which we'll explore kind of every angle of preparing for a holistic birth from choosing a support person to preparing body, mind, spirit, to navigating prenatal testing, the allopathic system, exploring complications, all of it. And I'm super excited about that. Um, wow. And so, Wow, that's yeah. cool. I want to do that. Do you have to be yeah. pretty pregnant? No, you can. Anyone is, everyone is welcome. Everyone is okay. welcome. So I haven't quite launched that yet, Luke, but you should join my mailing list through my website at freebirth.ca and awesome. uh, I'll tell you all about it. Wow. Thank you so much, man. I really <laughs> appreciate the conversation. Very, very meaningful, timely, and so, so important for where we find ourselves today. 
Uh, I really as, appreciate it too. As a species walking the earth. I mean, I think conversations, yeah, these conversations yes. are perhaps more important than ever, you know, and maybe I'll say the same thing in five years, but right now it seems, wow, man, we better really take a look at the way we do things, especially how we enter into the world. So thank you so much for your work and your generosity of time and spirit today. And I look forward to seeing you again. Likewise. Thank you so much, Luke. You take good care. As we conclude this conversation, I want to personally thank you for listening. And if you made it to the end of an episode, that means you've got some courage, my friend, because these issues are hard to face, especially for those of us who are already parents and perhaps have second thoughts on the ways in which we've given birth. And as I said in the beginning of the show, no shame here, man. I mean, I don't have kids yet, as you might have guessed from the episode. I'm planning to do so. But if you've done it and you have any regrets or misgivings, uh, forgive yourself. We're all doing the best we can. And I think that's a really important message as a takeaway here. However, that said, I very much align with the perspective Yolanda shared during this conversation. And I think it's an important one for us to explore and share if we feel called. So please share this episode with a couple of friends that you think might benefit from this information. I know the cognitive dissonance that many of us face when we're faced with realities that are less than pleasurable to explore uh, can be hard to break through, but these conversations serve just that purpose for those brave enough or at least curious enough to listen. I'd also like to add that this conversation and frankly, all of the conversations presented on the Lifestylist podcast would not be possible without our sponsor. So let's give a shout out to Magnesium Breakthrough. You can find them at magbreakthrough.com slash Luke. If you use the code Luke10, you'll save 10% off your order at magbreakthrough.com. By the way, magnesium is an important nutrient for making babies. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our friends at Organifi. You can find them at organifi.com slash lifestylist. That's Organifi with an I. The code there is lifestylist for 20% off. And lastly, let's give some big ups to our friends at GetTrueKava.com, where you can get one of the most relaxing elixirs and supplements in the world. Kava is an incredible plant medicine. In fact, I chugged about a quarter bottle of the tincture before I recorded this episode, believe it or not. That's incredible in that it has the ability to relax your nervous system without impairing your cognitive abilities, which is really unique when it comes to something that and potentially kind of knock you on your ass in the best of ways. So gettruekava.com is where you will find that substance. And uh, when you get over there, if you enter the code LUKE15, you're going to save 15% off your order. Now with all of our sponsors, or at least most of the time, you can find them at lukestory.com slash store. Do my best to make it easy for you so you don't have to remember all of these codes and links and all the things. So if you hear things that are interesting on the show, know that you can go to lukestory.com slash store and find all of the codes and links there. I have a really beautifully curated site there with all my favorite stuff. So get over there and get your goodies and you'll be um, also making a great contribution to keeping this show going and enabling me to do the work that I do. It takes a lot of time and energy to prepare for and conduct and conclude these episodes and edit them and get them out into the world. And uh, everything you buy from the sponsors or at the store goes directly to that cause. So thank you so much for your support. If you're uh, not well healed enough at the moment to buy products, don't worry about it. Just share the episode with a friend. That's a huge thanks and I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. While you're at it, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram? My Instagram is at Luke Story. And uh, this conversation that I recorded today that you're now hearing, as well as another one earlier with Leslie Kenny that will be airing after this, we're live streamed on my Instagram. So if you want to see the rough and tumble behind the scenes experience of recording a podcast, make sure to follow me there. I also do my very best to provide value and entertainment and information on my Instagram account, slipping through the cracks of the censorship so far, so good. So if you're hearing this relatively close to the release date, as of today, I'm still on there. Uh, I'm a bit of a Trojan horse. I try to get some controversial messages like the one you just heard out without getting completely nuked from the censorship-laden internet and social media platforms. So if you follow me over there, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Next week's show is a little bit lighter in context. It's with Lodro Rinsler, um, an incredible gentleman out of New York who is a longtime Buddhist meditation practitioner as well as teacher. So he's going to teach us next week 
how to use meditation and mindfulness and spiritual practices as a means by which to cope with stress. And uh, let's face it, in the last year and a half or so, we've experienced tons of that. So if you want to get down and learn how to acclimate yourself to the world spiritually, episode 347 with Lodro Rinsler next week will not disappoint. I'll be back in your eardrums then. Can't wait to share that one with you.